Professor Martin Smith is a neuroanesthetist and a neurointensivist in London. He is director of the Neurosurgical Critical Care Services at the National Hospital for, has, Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, University College London Hospitals, and honorary professor at UCL. He is a senior fellow at the UCL Biomedical Research Centre. His interests include the monitoring and management of acute brain injury, and he is well published in this field. Today he is going to discuss Beyond the Bolt, New Approaches to Multimodal Monitoring in Brain Injury. So, Martin Smith. Thank you, Thank you, thank you. Uh, Rob, thank you for the welcome. Um, also, I'd like to thank Mark and Paul for inviting me and you all and your society uh, for the opportunity to visit Australia and uh, attend your meeting. So, as uh, Rob said, I work in uh, this place here, uh, the National Hospital in Queen Square. We're part of a, a multi-faculty university teaching hospital right in the middle of London, although we have a separate campus. Uh, just some disclosures uh, in terms of this talk. I've received some research funding from various uh, monitoring manufacturers. And I also should say we have an IP interest in the use of a mathematical model of cerebral physiology in relation to monitoring, which I'll mention at the very end. So what I'm going to do is talk um, about different monitoring techniques and how we can bring these together to better inform our treatment decisions in the context of brain injury. But before I do that, I guess we just need to start with how we manage the injured brain. And of course, it's important to remember that the brain doesn't sit in isolation. It is the interaction between the brain and systemic organ systems that is key both in managing the injured brain and in understanding how treatment responses might happen. Of course, the aim of treatment is to prevent, minimize, and possibly treat secondary brain injury, which in essence is around brain ischemia. And we do this primarily by using a multifaceted neuroprotective strategy during which we optimize systemic physiology in order to maintain the brain's uh, metabolic uh, needs. I'm not going to talk about the pathophysiology of brain injury, except to say that, as you're all aware, it's complex and multifactorial. But I would put to you that, at least for the context of this talk, there are two components that are of key importance. And the first is the one that we think about all the time, that is the reduction in substrate delivery below critical thresholds, both in terms of oxygen and glucose. Now, we might debate what those critical thresholds are, but I think we can all accept that if we actually have reductions in delivery below them, then that's an issue for the injured brain. But of course, we also know now that there's a second component, and that is one of failing cellular metabolism. That is the inability of the mitochondria to use delivered oxygen and glucose. And that leads to a profound energy crisis within the injured brain. And what I will show you today, I hope, is that we can use conventional and novel monitoring modalities to get a handle on that physiology and pathophysiology and provide relevant clinical information. So I'm a simple sort of guy, and I like to look at things in a stylized way. So this is my interpretation of the brain here. This is the systemic physiological contributions to it, and this is the outflow from the brain. So of course, it's important to remember in monitoring the injured brain that we need to monitor the input, that is cardiorespiratory variables. That goes without saying. We can look at pressures. We do that all the time. We can look at blood flow. We can look at autoregulation. There's a lot of interest in looking at an autoregulatory state now after brain injury. We can look at various oxygenation variables, and I'll talk about some of those. We can look at brain tissue biochemistry now at the bedside, and of course we can look at electrophysiological changes. So there's lots going on. 
and it keeps us all in business, I guess. We've moved away, I think, from using one modality to this concept of needing to look at many modalities together because, of course, the physiological variables interact, both within the brain and within systemic physiological variables. And so multiple monitoring of these variables provides a much more complete picture than looking at one variable alone. And this allows us to cross-validate between um, different monitoring systems. It allowed us to reject artifact and, of course, gives us much greater confidence in making treatment decisions. So we can do all these things and we have lots of toys and we all get excited and the nursing staff like it on the ICU. But of course it's really important to remember that all this goes on within the context of this. That is a critically ill patient. And there is no point, there is no point at all in doing fancy monitoring and, and, and sort of fancy treatments that's guided by all these changes if you're not providing basic critical care for these patients. Tinkering with monitoring variables is just that, I suspect. It's tinkering at the edges. The, the, the great improvements in outcome after brain injury come with good general critical care. So, you're obliged to start with intracranial pressure monitoring, I guess, in a talk like this. It is the cornerstone of what we all do, those of us at least who look after brain injured patients. And of course it's important because resident cranial pressure is a very important cause of secondary brain injury. However, despite it's been used for decades, there are no class one data to support ICP guided management after TBI. There's lots of clinical evidence to support its use um, and clinical guidelines internationally recognize uh, that actually this is an important tool and that we should monitor and manage it. And it's also a relatively low risk, low cost and possibly high yield intervention. So we all do it. And I think it's fair to say that intracranial pressure and cerebral perfusion pressure monitoring and guided management has become a standard of care. So what is the evidence? Well, many of you will be familiar with this most recent uh, study uh, published by Randy Chestnut and his colleagues from Seattle, although it's a study that was conducted in South America, in, in Ecuador and Bolivia. And this is a study that compared treatment guided by intracranial pressure monitoring using standard management criteria against care based on clinical examination um, and radiological changes in the absence of ICP monitoring. There was no difference in outcome, both in terms of mortality at six months and also, importantly in this study, quite good assessments of functional outcome in survivors. There was in this study, though, interestingly, an increased burden of treatment in the patients who were managed according to clinical variables rather than ICP monitoring. And many of you will be aware that's in complete contrast to other studies that have looked at similar uh, experimental paradigms, which have actually shown an increased treatment burden in the ICP monitored group. So this study pretty clearly uh, confirms that care focused on maintaining ICP less than 20 is not superior to care based, in essence, on clinical judgment. But that doesn't mean to say we should stop doing it. What I think it does do, though, is reinforce the notion that we need to redefine how we use intracranial pressure monitoring. I think we apply very oversimplified concepts to the number itself and how we manipulate it, and therefore shouldn't be surprised that actually they don't always translate into improvement outcomes. I think the other thing that is absolutely clear is that intracranial pressure is only one part of multimodal monitoring strategy, and actually it's a very complex variable, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. <clears throat> 
What we know for sure is that brain resuscitation based on optimization of pressures only, that is intracranial pressure and cerebral perfusion pressure, do not prevent cerebral hypoxia in some, indeed that could say many patients. In this, this early study here in small numbers, so it's not great, but these were patients whose intracranial pressure and cerebral perfusion pressure were optimally, optimally managed, yet substantial proportions had significant brain hypoxia, depending on what threshold you use, but here less than 50 millimeters of mercury, here less than 10, despite normal perfusion pressures. So that tells us a very important uh, story. That is, that cerebral oxygenation, in essence an assessment of the adequacy of the perfusion that we can measure with intracranial and cerebral perfusion pressure monitoring, we need to know whether that is adequate and tissue oxygenation is a possible way into that. Now the best way to do that in 2013 is to use fancy imaging techniques and we get these pretty pictures of uh, maps of flow, volume, metabolic rate, oxygen extraction fraction, all the sort of information you want to manage the patient. But of course, these are not bedside, they are not continuous, yes, they're just pictures at one moment in time. So we need some sort of continuous assessment. And there are three ways, I would put to you, that we can measure cerebral oxygenation at the bedside, and I'll talk briefly about those now. I'll mention juggler venous eximetry simply to say that in my view at least, this is very important historically, but that personally I don't find this monitoring technique of enormous value in clinical practice on a day-to-day -day basis. But certainly it has taught us, or the studies that came through the late 80s and early 90s, have taught us really the foundations of our understanding of what happens to cerebral oxygenation changes after brain injury. And this is a very early, uh, early study from Claudia Robertson's group in, in Houston that showed two things. First, that actually desaturation below 50% in this study is associated with worst outcome. But also, not only is the absolute number important, but it's the burden of the hypoxia, potentially, that's generating that desaturation that is the most weighted factor in terms of outcome. And you can see in this bar chart here, we've got in the white bars the patients who are of a good recovery, and in the black bars the ones who are dead. And you can see the, the number of desaturations, so the burden of the tissue hypoxia, the greater that burden, the more likely the outcome is to be poor. And we know that to be true uh, in 2013, um, and, and, and it was Claudia's group who first demonstrated that to us. But now, most commonly, to measure brain tissue oxygen, we would insert a small microsensor based on a Clark type electrode, and that has pretty much become the gold standard for bedside monitoring of cerebral oxygenation. In contrast to juggler venous eximetry, which is a flow-weighted global measure, of course this is a hyperfocal measure, and that's very important, and it has its advantages and disadvantages, and I'll discuss some of that later. Uh, this is just to illustrate the point that it is focal if you place the probes in different parts of the brain. So here in a perifocal area, so possibly in an area of brain tissue that's at risk around a hematoma, say, and in normal appearing brain tissue in a large cohort of patients, there is a difference. That's not rocket science. I guess it's what you'd expect. We also know that trends in brain tissue PO2 are related to physiological and pathophysiological variables that might be of interest. For example, cerebral blood flow, oxygen extraction fraction. We also know, though, that brain tissue PO2 is also influenced by the diffusion capacity of oxygen from the capillary to the cell. Again, that makes sense, but that has probably not got much relevance in terms of its interpretation in the clinical field. 
So we know for sure now that increased hypoxia burden is associated with poor outcome, not only in terms of mortality, but as this slide shows here, in functional outcome in survivors. And again, that makes sense. If you reduce the ischemic burden in the injured brain, then we know that it's more likely you have better outcome. But here now we have a tool at the bedside that provides continuous information about that burden of hypoxia. So can we use that to influence our treatment? Well, here are some data from uh, the group in um, University of uh, Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, Peter LaRue's group, that actually used a group of historic controls who had standard ICP-CPP-directed treatment and prospectively a group of patients who had that and, in addition, had interventions to keep their brain tissue PO2 higher than a certain predefined threshold. In this study, uh, 2.7 kilopascals. And you can see that actually adding maintenance of brain oxygenation to your treatment paradigm resulted in reduced mortality and increased outcome, sorry, favorable outcome in survivors. What those headline data don't tell you is hidden in the small print, and that is there was no standardization about how the PO2 was maintained at this threshold level. And in this study, there were 27 different therapies used to treat brain tissue hypoxia. But what was clear was that it appeared to be the reversal of the hypoxia that was the prognostic feature. And here is just a more recent study trying to look at that same question in a slightly different way. Um, here, looking at episodes of brain tissue hypoxia and medical management to reverse it. And again, the three interventions that are commonly used in this study were increase in FiO2, uh, CPP augmentation, and sedation. But again, this study showed that it was the reversal of the low PO2 that was prognostic in terms of outcome. Now, of course, what we don't know is whether it's the intervention itself or it's the change in the PO2 that is important. I think it must be the former because, frankly, if increasing FiO2 was a panacea for improving the outcome after brain injury, then we'd all have been doing it for decades. And as I'm sure you're aware, we know pretty clearly that actually high FiO2s are potentially bad for the injured brain. So what do we know in summary about brain tissue PO2? Well, we know that interventions other than those that are designed to improve cerebral perfusion can reverse hypoxia. We know that hypoxic responsiveness is the marker of good outcome. And therefore, we can probably use trends in this variable to not only optimize brain tissue oxygenation, but actually potentially to tolerate higher ICPs and lower CPPs than we might otherwise contemplate. And as you know, these, the treatments of cerebral perfusion pressure brings high risks in terms of exogenous vasopressors and fluid volume. So trying to have a paradigm where you don't have to put the patient at that risk when actually it doesn't bring benefit to the injured brain is something that is very useful at the bedside. Sorry, that last slide just said that we need a randomized controlled trial, and probably you all know that that has now started. Pete LaRue is running Boost 2, uh, which will address the question, does maintaining brain tissue appear to above a certain threshold by specific interventions improve outcome after traumatic brain injury? So just a few words about the other, the non-invasive measure of cerebral oxygenation, and that is using near-infrared spectroscopy and cerebral oximetry. Um, measurement of regional cerebral tissue oxygen saturation is a reliable and continuous measure of the balance between cerebral oxygen delivery and utilization. So it ticks the boxes for what we want in terms of monitoring the injured brain, uh, and, and it's in essence, a, a measure of real-time oxygenation and hemodynamics. It has advantages of other, te other techniques. It's non-invasive, 
continuous and, importantly, multi-site. However, in terms of commercial systems, there are some issues, and this is perhaps where some of my biases come in, but there are a plethora of commercial systems, as you're aware, and there's a lack of standardization between them. Although most provide a summary measure in terms of, of a percentage, the algorithms inside these black boxes that are used to derive that number, and, and even actually the variables that are measured, vary between devices. So it's very difficult to compare the outputs from them. Also, it's important to be aware that we do not have predefined thresholds for hypoxia ischemia measured by near-infrared spectroscopy, despite what some of the manufacturers might tell you. So what's the experience of its routine use? Well, in terms of brain injury, where it might be expected to have some value, actually there's virtually no research. And, and perhaps that's partly because the optical complexity of the injured brain, tissue edema, blood in the CSF, actually invalidates some of the algorithms on which these commercial systems are based. There is, though, some evidence for its use in cardiac surgery and carotid surgery, and I'll very briefly uh, show you uh, some data there. Uh, there were early retrospective studies that suggested that targeting regional cerebral saturation to a certain level, above a certain level during cardiac surgery, minimized the risk of post-optive cognitive dysfunction and, and stroke. But actually, a recent meta-analysis has shown that actually overall that is not correct, and there's really only low-level evidence uh, for, to support its use during cardiac surgery. Although that being said, it's a completely safe technique, it's relatively cheap, so it is widely used. It's also used uh, often during carotid surgery to guide shunt placement, um, and in this regard, it has very similar diagnostic um, ability to the other modalities that you would use, but it's fair to say, to put that into context, the, the specificity of some of the standard modalities to guide shunt placement are also very, very low. The advantages, again, it has good temporal resolution um, and, and it's, it's continuous. However, and this is a really big however, different studies have used completely different thresholds to uh, prompt shunt placement. Some use absolute reductions from baseline, numbers picked out of a hat, 12 to 20% of the range in the literature, uh, and others use reductions to absolute numbers to 55 or 50%, again, picked out of the ether. And if you look at many of the studies, there are many patients whose baseline cerebral saturations are around here. So how that can be the threshold to prompt an intervention uh, is, is, is something that, that defeats me. This is a very recent study just published online that actually shows that, in fact, using near-infrared spectroscopy to, to prompt shunt placement has a very low predictive value. And in this study, actually, it would if you'd have used near-infrared spectroscopy rather than EEG, you would have had a 20% increase in shunt placement. So this is... This is a space to watch, I think. And just finally, there's a lot in the literature about using these devices to measure brain tissue saturation in patients who are having surgery in an essence of sitting position, the beach chair position here for shoulder surgery. This is just one of those studies showing that the brain saturation is much lower in the, in the beach chair position compared to a lateral decubitus position. And these authors suggested that the incidence of cerebral desaturation events was much higher, 8% in the beach chair position and 0% in the lateral position, and also the median number was higher. Well, well what do that, does that mean? A recent study has tried to help us to actually look at neuropsychological changes in patients who have desaturation interoperatively in the sitting position for shoulder surgery against those who don't, and there is absolutely no difference. And to me, there's a real dilemma here. The only point for using monitoring is that if 
you measure some abnormality, that can trigger a response. And here we have a very high rate of adverse events, that is cerebral desaturations, against a very, very low incidence of neurological sequelae after surgery in that position. Now, I'm not suggesting we should ignore that very small risk, but actually if you're picking up these events in 80% of the patients and the incidence of neurological damage is minuscule, then we've got a real problem in terms of over-treating. And so it's important when using the devices to actually understand what they're actually measuring. And we know that cardiovascular variables affect tissue saturation, metabolic rate, but most importantly, intracranial geometry. These devices depend on the absorption of light. And if you shift the intracranial geometry from moving on supine to head-up position, the number that the bot records will be different. So it's really important to remember that. I'll skip over that, actually. So, what is the future for these devices? Well, perhaps there is one, and I guess it won't be in the sort of things we see on, on, on the shelves at the moment. I think it'll be new technology. This is a complicated slide. You can ignore most of it. It's really just a preliminary study using uh, a time-resolved near-infrared spectroscopy system, which has many advantages over simple cerebral oximetry that I've described so far. And in this study, uh, using uh, a TRS NIRS, there it was possible to predict reductions in, sorry, to relate reductions in cerebral tissue saturation against vasospasm proven by angiography in a cohort of patients with um, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And also, what was important in this study was, and you can see a sort of anecdote example here, is that you could, that in several of the patients, there were reductions in tissue saturation in the presence of vasospasm when actually transcranial Doppler was relatively normal. I think the other thing I will show you, uh, and again, just briefly, is that actually, as the technology moves on, it's possible to develop imaging systems using near infrared, and this is a, a recent uh, publication showing an example of that. Multiple sources and detectors, 32 here, with accurate depth discrimination for oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And this was during carotid surgery, and just very quickly, uh, here we've got baseline, here we've got the cross clamp just gone on the right internal carotid artery, and 20 seconds after the cross clamp's gone on. And you can see in these optical images, derived entirely by light, clearly a very marked reduction in oxygenated hemoglobin during, during the cross clamp period. So I'm sure these are the devices that actually, as they become more user-friendly, will be the ones that you will see in the operating room and possibly in the ICU. So cerebral oxygenation monitoring is a key part of multimodal monitoring on the ICU, but each monitor has not yet become a standard of care. They all have their individual advantages and disadvantages. Probably uh, optical techniques have the most potential for technological advance, but we are some way off uh, them being as clinical tool yet. Just a word about cerebral blood flow. You all laugh. When I started doing research in brain injury, that is exactly how we measured cerebral blood flow in our research patients on the ICU. Now, actually, luckily, we don't do that anymore. We can use transcranial Doppler. That doesn't, of course, measure blood flow per se, but actually blood flow velocity. It's a non-invasive measure, and we use it most commonly, I think, to diagnose and monitor vasospasm. And, and I'll say no more about that now. Just one word, though, again, technology moves forward. We now have a little probe that actually you can put next to all your other probes in the brain. Suddenly there are three things, four things, five things sticking out of the head. This is called thermal diffusion flowmetry, and it provides a quantitative assessment of regional cerebral blood flow around the probe tip measured in absolute flow values. And here's just an example of a study that's looked at changes in regional cerebral blood flow during increases in arterial pressure and hyperventilation after traumatic brain injury. Now, for me, I'm not sure what the value is of measuring absolute cerebral blood flow at the bedside. I think it's a bit like the pressure marker. It's in some ways, unless it's critically, critically low, 
Does it really matter what the blood flow is? What you need to know again is, is it adequate for that region of brain's metabolic activity at that moment in time? And these sort of devices currently don't tell us that. It might, though, be useful in measuring autoregulation. And I said at the beginning, there's a big interest in moving to assessing autoregulatory reserve because we know for sure that actually if you can manage brain injured patients within their autoregulatory range, then actually that appears to be associated with improved outcome. And so this thing called the pressure reactivity index has been uh, developed uh, primarily from ideas from the Cambridge group in the UK. And in essence, it's a moving correlation between slow wave changes in mean arterial blood pressure and intracranial pressure. And of course, in a normal uh, brain, if the blood pressure, systemic blood pressure increases, there's a bit of cerebral vasoconstriction, the ICP falls, and all that happens to keep the cerebral blood flow constant. So if the blood pressure and the ICP are out of phase, so there's a negative relationship between them, that represents a normal vascular bed, and that's a negative PRX. Conversely, in a pressure passive bed, where the, uh, where the relationship is, is positive, then that's abnormal. So PRX ranges from minus one, which is fully normal, to plus one, which is abnormal. And you can measure PRX continuously, and you can shift the perfusion pressure and see what happens to it. So there is this developing notion that you can manage a patient within the optimal cerebral perfusion pressure. That is where their autoregulatory reserve is most preserved. And there is some evidence that if you do that, then you will drive a more favorable outcome. So I apologize for this slide in advance. This is some of our data. This is a crazy slide. It's there because we're getting towards the end, and it's a pretty picture. In fact, one of my PhD students won the UCL prize for art in medicine for, for, a, for a variation on that image. So this is a non-invasive way of measuring autoregulation. Here, we've still got blood pressure. Here, we now, instead of intracranial pressure, we've got a, we've got a marker of the hemoglobin concentration in the brain, measured with near-infrared. And you can do these very fancy wavelet transforms here, and in essence, measure a wavelet coherence. And when it's red, that shows there's very high agreement of phase alignment. So that suggests, actually, that um, the, the patient's not autoregulating. The haemoglobin volume and the mean pressure are in sync. If, however, you then look at a patient who is autoregulating, then this wavelet coherence plot looks a different colour, it's more blue. So simplistically, then possibly this could be the biomarker you need at the bedside. You simply shift the pressure up and down and you watch this sort of plot change from red to blue until actually you've got the optimum range. So finally, let's go to the other part of the pathophysiology. So far, we've really been looking at measures that talk about substrate delivery. What about the metabolic component of that. Well, cerebral microdialysis has been uh, a well-established laboratory tool for, for some decades now. And about 10 years ago, it became possible uh, to do microdialysis online at the bedside when, when a bit of kit like this was, was launched. And measuring biochemistry gives you probably a better handle on the processes of secondary brain injury. And in essence, this is a blood capillary. This is the microdialysis catheter. You're all aware that you influence fluid down it. There's a semi-permeable membrane here. You collect fluid here, and anything in the ECF is equilibrated with that microdiazolate. And so, in essence, we are interested in looking at glucose metabolism primarily. So there'll be decreased glucose and oxygen and cellular energy failure. We can look at cellular bioenergetics by measuring the ratio of the lactate to pyruvate in the brain ECF. We can look for reductions in glucose as a marker of abnormality. We can look at glycerol. That's perceived to be a marker of cell membrane disintegration. So glycerol is relieved from the phospholipid membrane into the ECF. We can look at excitotoxicity. But of course, the great thing about microdialysis is 
you can actually measure anything that's crossed this membrane. So in essence, this is a universal biosensor. You can use all, measure all sorts of novel biomarkers. Its, but its greatest use, though, probably is trying to get a handle between those two pathophysiological components that I talked about. And, to, so, and, and in that regard, two types of increases in the lactate pyruvate ratio have been described. In the first type, there's a reduction in pyruvate, but also an increase in lactate. And as you all remember from biochemistry, that represents a classic ischemia pattern. But also, after brain injury, there is a type 2 elevation of the LPR. And in this case, the pyruvate is the predominant metabolic perturbation. And that is known to represent impairment of the glycolytic pathway. So that is the marker of mitochondrial failure. So, of course, if you combine another monitoring tool with this, that is brain tissue PO2, here the brain tissue PO2 will probably be reduced. Here, potentially, it is normal. So how can this help us? Well, here's a measure of lactate pyruvate ratio. This is a real patient. The lactate pyruvate ratio is here, and this is time. And you can see there are two recordings of it. The first from this catheter just alongside this subdural. So that's probably brain tissue at risk of secondary injury. The second from a catheter in normal brain. So that's a great example about understanding which bit of the brain you're monitoring is important because the output from the monitor is determined entirely where the probe is in a focal monitor. So here we've got pretty much normality the whole time. This is the normal range of LPR that we use. Clearly something's going wrong here. The lactate pyruvate ratio is rising. We were doing a pretty bad job. The cerebral perfusion pressure was low. Increase that and the metabolic variables return to normal. The other strength of microdialysis is that actually there are some data, this is one of our studies, but also in subarachnoid hemorrhage, to actually suggest that the biochemical variables pre precede the changes in other monitored modalities. Not necessarily brain tissue appear PO2, but certainly the pressure changes and, and, and transcranial Doppler changes. So it may be that actually the biochemical changes may be early warning signs of imminent clinical deterioration and may broaden the therapeutic window. What we don't know at all at the moment, though, is, is whether you intervene to reverse these changes that is related to improvements in outcome. We do, though, know that microdialysis variables are very good predictors of outcome. Again, this is work from the Cambridge group showing that lactate pyruvate ratio is associated both with mortality and with unfavorable outcomes. So, so people are beginning to use these data for predictive purposes as well. So again, cerebral microdialysis is useful for treatment, great for research, and again, like brain tissue PO2, potentially it gives us the confidence to withhold dangerous treatment, to, to keep increasing the perfusion pressure if the biochemistry and the oxygen is normal. So just finally, back to optical techniques, one of my interests. So it just so happens that part of the electron transfer chain in the mitochondria, the, the cytochrome C oxidase, uh, can be measured, its oxidation status can be measured by near-infrared spectroscopy because it has a, a typical absorption spectra in the near-infrared range like haemoglobin. And we know that cytochrome is responsible for the majority of oxygen metabolism and it has been validated as a measure of cerebral energy status. So potentially this is another new biomarker we could look at. And this is some work from uh, Martin Tisdale, one of my PhD students a few years ago. And this is in volunteers. And he, he looked at changes in oxygen delivery in volunteers, healthy volunteers. And you see here, you can't really see that, but this is an assessment of cerebral oxygen delivery moving from hypoxemia, so saturations of between 75 and 80 percent, to, to back to baseline, to recovery. And here is a marker of, of, this is a haemoglobin variable, a marker of brain oxygenation measured with near-infrared. Again, you get that change. And for the first time, he showed there was increase in the oxidation status of cytochrome during that reversible 
that reversal of hypoxia. And what was interesting in this study is that actually the conventional near-infrared marker, that is the hemoglobin variable, was not so well related to estimated oxygen delivery to the brain, but actually the cytochrome variable was. And subsequently, we've repeated that paradigm now with hyperoxia in the injured brain. And this is a, a, a cohort of brain injured patients. Again, oxygen delivery to the brain, FiO2 of 100%. You can see an increase in oxygen delivery, as you'd expect, and an increase in the oxidation status of cytochrome, and with that, a, 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 an improvement in the lactate pyruvate ratio. Both those changes consistent with increased aerobic metabolism. So potentially we have a non-invasive and continuous biomarker now or cerebral metabolic state that we can use at the bedside. Not a clinical tool yet because that is, that is the research kit that makes those measurements. Just one final thing. Um, you're all aware that there is concern with near-infrared spectroscopy about contamination from extracranial circulation. And that is absolutely true for the oxygenation and haemoglobin variables. But this is one of our recent studies looking at the depth penetration of the cytochrome signal. So here's, here's the front end we use. Here's the light emitter. And here are four light detectors. And I'm sure you're aware the logic is that the further the detector from the emitter, the more likely is the signal has passed through the brain. And you can see that for cytochrome here, this is during hypoxemia in volunteers, the cytochrome signal in the farthest detector is way separated from the nearer detectors, suggesting that is a very strong brain signal. Whereas if you look at the haemoglobin variables, which is what the cerebral oximetrists measure that you buy off the shelf, then actually there is no difference between these three detectors, suggesting that there is equal contributions from brain and scalp. So our view is that actually the oxidation status of cytochrome might be a much more brain-specific signal of cerebral metabolism and therefore would be superior to haemoglobin uh, in, in that respect. Just one word about EEG. There is no time to, to do that. Um, but you know the indications for EEG in the ICU particularly are changing because we know that non-convulsive seizures are much more common than we imagined. And if you don't do EEG monitoring, you won't pick them up. We also know that cortical spreading depolarizations are also very common and affect outcome after brain injury. At the moment, the only way you can monitor these is with implantable electrodes, so it's not a bedside reality. And if you're interested in EEG, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine uh, really published, recently published some consensus guidance for recommendations of its use. Finally, back to carotids. Uh, this is a recent meta-analysis of different monitoring modalities during carotid surgery to guide shunt placement. EEG comes out way better than the others they looked at, evoked potentials, near-infrared and TCD. So EEG still seems to be the gold standard there. So, we've talked about individual techniques. I told you at the beginning that putting them all together gives a much greater ability to tailor treatment regimes to an individual. It allows you to potentially withhold therapy that is not giving benefit in terms of reversal of brain ischemia or metabolic disturbance. It might assist in prognostication, certainly is useful for research. The problem is that the data sets from all these monitors are absolutely massive, and it's impossible to interpret them at the bedside. And we need something that does that for us. We need user-friendly, clinical, clinically relevant information at the bedside. And one of the things that we're interested in now is using a mathematical model of cerebral hemodynamics and metabolism to sit between the data and the output to bring some sort of intelligent interpretation to that, certainly to remove artifact and, and possibly to display unmeasured variables, for example, cerebral metabolic rate. The model can actually give you a, an output for metabolic rate with very simple model inputs. And so this is one of the things that actually we're interested in. So what's the future? Well. The manufacturers are realizing that having four or five things sticking out of the head is not good, so we'll definitely move to single probes to measure multiple modalities. I think stereotactic placement will become 
more common so we know where the probe is sitting. Personally, I think that non-invasive devices are the way to go. I think we will see bedside imaging systems in the very near future. There are some pictures from one of my colleagues in medical physics. These are pictures in babies, but they are, they are maps of blood volume and blood flow. You'll have to take my words for that. Measured entirely with light. So I'd like to thank my colleagues who uh, I work with. Uh, like Tony, I agree, collaboration with basic science is crucial. Some people on that list are medical physicists, others bioengineers. I'd like to thank the people who have funded us in the past and continue to do so, so now, and thank you all for listening. I bring you greetings from the Society for Neuroscience and Anesthesiology and Critical Care, and if you are going to the ASA and can get there early, please come to our meeting. Uh, it's two weeks yesterday and today, and if you're not going to the ASA and fancy a trip to San Francisco, then please come and see us in any case. Thank you very much for listening.